Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today is the 10th of June 2020 and what I want to talk about is radiation exposure from fission power that most do not know about and how it may be used for good. So first off, I want to talk about nuclear reactors are here to stay. And if you look at this chart here, you will see that I've overlaid a chart from the World Nuclear Association called Nuclear Electricity Production, and it spans from 1970 through to 2018. And if you look, I've added on some significant events to that slide. The first is in 1979, and that is the Three Mile Island accident. And if you look around that, leading up to that, it seems to be looking like an almost an exponential curve of world nuclear energy production increase. Then there's a kind of slight flattening off in that year, and then it continues on as if nothing else happened. Then if you look at first, second quarter, 1986, we have the Chernobyl incident. And really, that did not make a dent in the increase in production of nuclear electricity. And it kind of flattens off around the sort of 1990s. And then we have the dot-com crash in 2001. And there's basically a ripple around that time, kind of still trending upwards. But it isn't until we kind of get towards and, and around the financial crisis in mid-2008 that we see it kind of a, a roundabout flatten. But still, you would argue that the trend is upwards. And it isn't really until the event of Fukushima Daiichi in March 2011 that you really see a big drop away from the 2010 figure. And, and then it goes really quite a lot down. And so what actually happened then is essentially all of the reactors in Japan were taken offline. But from that point onwards, you see this growth continuing up there. And I'll explain where that came from in the next slide. At the end there, you see a note that I've put down the bottom that four of the Japanese reactors were started in 2018. And the data from the World Nuclear Association kind of falls away at that point in this chart. So how... Did you see this increase after the initial drop after Fukushima Daiichi? How can we explain that? Well, that is essentially the capacity massively increasing in China. So if we go back to the previous slide, you will see that it is the light blue at the bottom, the Asia area that precipitously drops due to Fukushima. And that's because Japan has gone offline. And then it goes back up. And that is because we have the production in China really skyrocketing. The reality is many reactors are 40 years old and there is data out there that's saying they expect these reactors, which were never meant to last for 80 years, to last for another 40 years. So that is for old reactor designs. And one might expect that new reactor designs could even fare better and last for longer. And so it's reasonable to say that the reactors that were installed in this century will outlive all of the 6.1 billion people that were born in the last century. So think about that for a minute. The isotopes that I want to raise your attention to are two. The first of those is 14 carbon. And there is a well-known risk since 1977. And this is a study that was done by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is operated at the time by Union Carbide Corporation. One might think of them, unfortunately, for the world's worst gas leak, which may have killed up to 8,000 within two weeks of the event and 8,000 since and harmed over half a million Indians. Uh, that was a corporation that was approximately 50% owned by Union Carbide. But actually that occurred in the 1980s. So this actual study, as you see in the highlighted 
text that I've got down on there on the right. It was published in 1977, so it was actually before that accident. And this study is looking at all the different ways that carbon-14 is produced in nuclear reactors and what is done with it. I recommend you go and look at it. I've given the link there, and in fact, all of the links in this presentation will be given in the presentation that will be given as a PDF in the description to this video. So, 14 carbon production and disposal. Well, naturally, in your body and in all living organisms on Earth, you typically find around about one part per trillion in biological material. And this is, as we believe, synthesized by 14 nitrogen in the air, which is 78% of the air that you're breathing right now, and cosmic ray interaction. And this leads to CO2 that is containing a proportion of 14 carbon, and that enters into plants through photosynthesis, and then animals eat plants and it enters into all other life on the planet. Now, in a nuclear reactor, the same process which I've highlighted in reaction two, which is from that report I gave on the previous slide, is the NP reaction with the 14 nitrogen to 14 carbon. So this actually occurs also in a nuclear reactor. But also you can get the ND, that's a neutron in and a deuteron out, and the production of 14 carbon, but also reactions with 16 oxygen and 17 oxygen, producing 3 helium and 4 helium, or alpha particles, to produce 14 carbon. Now, there is another reaction, and that is the neutron gamma reaction from 13 carbon to 14 carbon. And the natural carbon in the environment, as well as being one part per trillion carbon 14, is also 1.1% carbon 13. And this breeds under the neutron flux in the reactor to this carbon 14, just adding another neutron in there. So it's a slightly heavier isotope. And where this is a particular problem is in the uh, Russian design RBMK reactors, of which Chernobyl was one, and uh, British reactors where they use graphite as moderator blocks. And so moderator blocks are doing the purpose of slowing down uh, neutrons. And some of them are captured by the 13 carbon and breed 14 carbon. Also, carbon's throughout the materials in there. And so you get this production overall from these carbon, nitrogen and oxygen reactions in a nuclear reactor that produce carbon 14. Now... The carbon-14 that is produced in nuclear reactors is dumped as radioactive gases into the atmosphere. And this is wording from that report from 1977. It increases the radioactive load on all biology on Earth, including humans. That's essentially what it's saying in that report. And they do say that to a degree, some of this is absorbed by the water, uh, as CO2 is absorbed by the water in the seas, but then shellfish and, and, and fish and so forth, which may enter the land food chain, also can be absorbing that carbon. And so it's not necessarily <laughs> disappearing. But the reality is there is ways, and it talks about ways that you can capture this CO2 with the high concentration of 14 carbon, but generally it's dumped into our atmosphere. The carbon-14 isotope normally decays in 5,730 years, and that's the basis of radiocarbon dating. So your load when you are alive, or an animal or a plant, when it's alive, it absorbs from the CO2 in the environment. But when it's dead, it can't actually take on more carbon-14. And so the proportion of carbon-14 goes to half its activity over 5,730 years. So if you have, say, a, a man found in a peat bog and you do a carbon dating on it and it has to half the output of a typical animal that would have died yesterday, for instance, you can suggest that it may be around about 5,730 years old. And so that's the basis of radiocarbon dating. And what that is telling you is that the carbon-14 that's synthesized in nuclear reactors is going into the environment and it is accumulating there. So they are very right to note that the CO2 in the environment is increasing the radioactive load on all biology on Earth, including humans. 
Now, that's carbon-14. The other isotope I want to talk about in this presentation is 85 krypton. And that was well known, and I've put in inverted commas again, risk since 1960s. And this was really brought to the fore in the Soviet sphere by one Ivan Filimonenko. And Ivan Filimonenko is uh, someone that's not really known about, really, with a lot of cold fusion and low energy nuclear reaction researchers. But apparently he developed a palladium deuterium cold fusion in 1957. But this, unfortunately, was under secret programs. So really, it is Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons that should get credit for really making that something that people were aware of. And in the 1960s, he warned about the emissions of 85 krypton from the plutonium production for the nuclear weapons race and from fission power generally. And the story goes that uh, people really didn't like uh, this conversation being had out into the open. And so he was kind of um, incarcerated for his views. In interestingly enough, he came back after the 1989 announcement and, and worked a little, as I understand it, on Lernge nuclear reaction after it was brought into a public sphere. So I think it was a case of, uh, oh, we were doing this in the 50s and 60s, and so maybe we can see if it works again. Anyway, there's a little YouTube link down there and you can see him talking about his experiences and there, there's other media on the internet uh, about that. But really, I just want to raise this uh, point about the 85 Krypton. Now, the 85 Krypton production and disposal, it is basically a synthetic isotope uh, produced in nuclear fission reactors, uh, as uh, uh, Filimenko um, was warning about. And there are some small natural sources, and you can imagine that, you know, uranium's there are much rarer element isotopes and, and even elements than uranium in the Earth's crust. And so if you can imagine you've got a volcano and it's belching out a lot of fumes or an earthquake releases a load of gases, um, then uranium decay will have produced some of this uh, noble gas, which will then be released in those events. But um, the bulk of uh, the additional uh, um, 85 krypton comes from uh, man uh, actually fissioning uh, uranium. And the uh, yield is 0.3%. Uh, so you get um, uh, three atoms of 85 krypton for every 1,000 uranium-235 fissions. And so it's actually quite a lot of uh, krypton that you get out. And of course, it's a noble gas, so it doesn't really react with much. And it's quite heavy, so it lies around sort of where animals live. Um, it has a short half-life. It's sort of fairly comparable with um, tritium. Uh, and uh, it has a, a reasonably high uh, uh, beta decay energy. Uh, and that is 99.57% of the decays are that reasonable uh, energy um, uh, beta decay. Uh, obviously, there are isotopes that are synthesized in nuclear reactors that have a shorter half-life, like cobalt-60, which is a, a beta isotope also. But uh, that's obviously a solid and uh, can be reacted with things. Uh, Krypton is a gas, and this was uh, Filomenenko's uh, concern that it's just adding to the uh, radiation load on biology on the planet. Uh, it can also naturally emit a 514 keV gamma, and that's for the remaining 0.43% of the natural decays. And it decays to stable 85 rubidium. And rubidium is very interesting for us, um, and that is because I think it's the second uh, uh, lowest uh, um, work function. So it really is good at releasing uh, electrons uh, if you needed it to do that. And currently, practically all 85 krypton is, again, unfortunately dumped into the atmosphere. And there's uh, some ways, I think I think some can kind of dissolve in water or whatever. Um, and you can go and research that in your own time. So, as you may know, um, one of the focuses that I personally have is to try and see if we can look to deal with the... Uh, radioisotopes that are emitted from nuclear reactors because nuclear reactors are a good way for uh, societies to have uh, predominantly clean energy 
um, uh, and stable energy supplies. And so can we, can we deal with these uh, uh, isotopes? Well, Alexander Parkamov, as I've talked about, and you can see this on our channel, he, he has shown in his book Space Earth Human that focus cosmogenic cold neutrinos, these are not relativistic neutrinos. These, these are neutrinos that uh, um, that are synthesized uh, in the case of cosmogenic ones, uh, supposedly uh, at the birth of the universe, but also maybe in supernovas and in suns. But the problem is they don't travel fast enough to escape the sun's gravitational well. So you don't really observe many from the sun. It's really the, the bulk of them are coming from uh, uh, the cosmos. And uh, he showed that you can measurably stimulate the decay of beta isotopes he has also showed that cold neutrinos can be uh, achieved technologically by heating dense matter, solids, liquids, and, and uh, dense uh, plasmas, uh, above 1,000 degrees centigrade. It's actually, it looks like about 1,080, um, but let's say 1,000 degrees centigrade. And the, the more matter you have at that temperature and the higher the temperature, the greater the synthesis of cold neutrinos. And I've given a link to a YouTube video where I describe the paper that he wrote on that. Now, the reverse beta interactions that we are interested in in this case are the 14 carbon plus a neutrino goes to 14 uh, nitrogen and an electron with that 156 kV um, energy and also the 85 krypton plus a neutrino goes to 85 rubidium plus the uh, 687 MeV uh, uh, beta particle. And so what we're trying to do is force those uh, to occur much faster than they would naturally. So much faster than 10.7 years in the case of 85 krypton and much faster than the thousands, many thousands of years of 14 carbon. Now, if MFMP's supernova experiment shows stimulated beta decay of either 40 potassium or 14 carbon, then it opens up the opportunity to deal with these radionuclides. So can we use these isotopes to produce uh, efficiency gains or power generation in uh, technological devices? Well, the supernova reactor, and you can look at, uh, if you just search for supernova on our channel, you can see all kinds of videos and so you can really understand what it is and, and so on, the plans for the testing. That reactor is a dusty plasma device and the dust that it starts with uh, is carbon. It looks like that that would synthesize through uh, George Oshawa nuclear transmutation reactions, um, the kind of uh, elements that you have in your body, but it starts uh, predominantly with carbon dust. And carbon is dense matter and it has the highest melting point of any element. And so this would be expected according to uh, the understanding uh, put forward in Space Earth Human by Alexander Parkamov to produce high levels of cold neutrinos. The other good thing about it is, is that it can get charged up with electrons. Uh, these do play a role. And uh, if as it is a very high uh, temperature uh, material, um, it, it uh, won't sort of coagulate and, and form lumps. Um, uh, and so it stays in the dusty form that uh, is um, uh, able to participate in the dusty plasma reaction. Now, elements that are synthesized, as we've done in uh, NOVA testing in the past, things like silicon and, and things like uh, iron and, and, and uh, uh, calcium, th th these things uh, can coagulate and they tend to drop down and form lumps of material at the bottom of the reactor. But anyway, essentially carbon is a dense matter that has the highest melting point of any element and so would be expected to produce high levels of cold neutrinos. Now normally in a supernova experiment, a proportion of the carbon is oxidized via air contact. But what if the air was replaced with 85% Krypton, which is, as you know, a noble element. Uh, this would prevent oxidation. And the other beautiful thing about 85 Krypton, it is uh, of the stable, uh, although this is not stable, but of the uh, normal gases uh, in, in that group, uh, it is um, uh, the second lowest ionization energy. Um, 
So, uh, can a supernova-like inspired device prove to be more than a beta isotope disposal device? Could it become a power generator? Now, the interesting thing about uh, 85 Krypton is one way that people detect that it's being um, uh, produced, and, and that is an indicator of, say, plutonium production for nefarious reasons, is that it increases the... Uh, electrical conductivity in the atmosphere around where it's released. And uh, you would imagine that this comes from uh, two uh, related processes, uh, and in fact three. Uh, one is uh, it is readily ionized, as I've just said. Two, it's decaying, producing that uh, relatively high energy uh, beta, and that that beta can then ionize other krypton atoms uh, in a, a sort of avalanche way, and that would uh, um, produce a very sort of electric air. And so you get, apparently, thunderstorms, uh, electric storms around uh, areas where these um, uh, 85 krypton is being um, released. Can we revisit the Tesla carbon button lamp and make the button from materials containing enriched 14 carbon and the rarefied gas in there be rarefied 85 krypton? Okay, so uh, this is an idea that I'm going to explore in a coming presentation. And um, I just want to put the idea out there for people to think about. Could this make a very efficient device that remediates nuclear waste at the same time? So uh, it produces uh, the, the temperature of the carbon button in there. Uh, will get to uh, the carbon filament light bulbs used to get to around about 1700 1800 degrees the um, carbon button light bulb may get to a higher temperature than even a tungsten filament light bulb that's typically around about two and a half thousand degrees so uh, this could maybe even get a higher temperature which means a large proportion of the material in the button is at uh, the temperature required to produce cold neutrinos and this could stimulate the decay of uh, 14 carbon and 85 krypton which would go on to uh, cause cascade, cascade uh, avalanche uh, sort of towns and avalanche uh, releases of electrons and having 85 krypton in there also is again a uh, easily ionized gas and it decays to 85 rubidium which is an, a, a low work function um, element. So there's plenty of opportunities for that. So I want to look at this in a serious way in a coming presentation. And because of all those avalanche effects and the release of free electrons and, and so forth and, and the low work function material that's a byproduct, could we even get to um, making a device like this uh, become a direct electricity generating device? So I want to put that idea in your heads now. Now, can we combine this idea with the uh, recently exposed uh, idea of the vacuum capacitor? Uh, it, there is a link there to the YouTube presentation where I discuss the vacuum capacitor. So can we use the 85 Krypton in the vacuum capacitor to make a far more efficient vacuum capacitor and potentially with a net gain? Can we produce a hybrid Tesla carbon button vacuum capacitor device using primordial and or synthetic beta isotopes to form the basis of a combined electrical generator and storage device? Wow, I mean... For me, uh, this is a concept I came up with within 12 hours of seeing uh, the vacuum capacitor. And, uh, um, you know, I would love this to be uh, researched, really, um, because many of the things like uh, radioactive elements, even electrons, X-rays and all kinds of things, even neutrons uh, and the understanding of transmutation, fission, fusion, n none of this was on the table when Tesla was awarded his carbon button patent. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there's some serious opportunities when you, uh, um, if we can demonstrate that the supernova does reduce the amount of uh, 14 carbon in a sample that is in there, then it's, it's off to the races uh, with this technology. Really, there's so many ways you can go. And I'm trying to spell out 
<laughs> options potentially if if we manage to achieve that. Uh, even still, I would suggest that the carbon button lamp uh, needs to be revisited in the context of uh, other aspects that have been learnt about since. Now, you might be saying, well, isn't it dangerous to put a radioactive gas into a light bulb or a little energy generating device? Well, this is from Lind. And you can actually buy Krypton 85 because, let's face it, it's a uh, toxic gas <laughs> um, and you might want to find somewhere to get rid of it and sell it. And it says here on their website, which I've given the link to the product page, Krypton 85 is a radioactive gas found in the atmosphere and produced by nuclear explosions, nuclear power plants, volcanoes and earthquakes. Krypton 85 is odorless, colourless, tasteless and emits low level radiation of both gamma and beta radios, rays. Krypton 85 is usually produced in gas mixtures with argon or xenon to improve the ionization in light bulbs by reducing their starting voltage. It is also used in plasma displays, uh, spark gaps, and for leak detection. It's already used in <laughs> light bulbs because for the same reason it causes uh, electrical storms around uh, plutonium production or, or, or you know, uh, fuel processing from, uh, you know, used fuel rods from nuclear reactors and even nuclear reactors themselves. Um, that's why it's put into light bulbs and plasma displays. And this it essentially says that what I'm hypothesizing in uh, the slide for can we uh, produce a hybrid uh, Tesla carbon button or and or uh, um, uh, vacuum capacitor is basically saying, well, it's going to help. It's likely to give an extra piece of efficiency here. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's quite a lot of reasons to consider this as a way forward. So here's my conclusions from today. As long as most organic lives living today will live on Earth, nuclear reactors will be present, producing radioactive beta isotopes. At least two of these, 14 carbon and 85 krypton, will, if nothing is changed, be almost entirely dumped into our biosphere. It doesn't matter what comes along. When you sign these contracts for these reactors, you know, for instance, the new one that's going to be built in the UK, it's guaranteed for 50 years. So it's definitely going to be here for 50 years. It's going to outlive me. So it's going to be producing 14 carbon and 85 krypton, which will essentially be, for the most part, dumped into the atmosphere. Now, this is a toxic waste emission. Can we make it into a valuable commodity? We should explore the possibility of the use of these isotopes to produce energy or greatly increase efficiency in the process of reducing their activity. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, I, I'm uh, really happy that I was able to get this uh, concept out to you, and I'd really like you to think about uh, the implications. Uh, this is leading into the testing of the supernova reactor. But as I say, I want to do uh, first a kind of explanation of how the Tesla carbon button light bulb worked and how we might be able to make that into uh, potentially a more efficient device or a, uh, a generator or a generator storage device using the concepts I've put forward in this video. And I'd also like to say that uh, it's about 67, 68% of you that watch uh, MFMP videos that are not subscribed. And so you are missing out on getting the the sort of uh, uh, first look at videos like this. And if you like the uh, volunteer work that we do and uh, you like the, the sort of ideas that I'm able to present to you, uh, please consider uh, donating uh, to help us. There are descriptions of how you can do that in the uh, video description. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.